32-bit float has created the ability for the home studio musician to record instruments in a way never before possible. It allows for remote recording sessions to happen freely without worrying about making a catastrophic mistake in setting levels at the time of recording. It speeds up the recording process because you don't have to spend time setting the levels. Also, decisions around compression can be made later because I have the entire dynamic range of the original sound wave to work with in post. It isn't just an incremental change in gain resolution. It completely removes a constraint in the recording process. I'll show you how this transformative workflow change speeds up recording time, enables remote recording sessions, and allows decisions that traditionally need to be made at the time of recording to happen in post. I've been recording drums with 32-bit float for about two years now. It's allowed me to get professional sounding drum recordings that I would not otherwise be able to achieve within the limitations of a home studio. I can't play my drums at home. It will bother the neighbors, so I rent a practice space. I can't bring my entire home studio to the practice space, and frankly, I don't have enough outboard gear to record drums the traditional way. Being able to capture the full dynamic range of my drum kit in my practice space and work with it in post at home has given me the ability to produce drum recordings at a lower financial outlay and with more flexibility than I would otherwise be able to do. And if I upgrade some part of my outboard gear, I have the original full dynamic range recordings to work with to remix my tracks. Now, I'm not a great drummer yet, although I'm working hard to become one. The reason I started playing drums is because I wanted to record them. I know this is backwards. I was making a lot of music with modular synthesizers and keyboards and using a drum synthesizer for all of this. As much as I liked the sound of the Vermona DRM-1 Mark III, I craved the sound of real drums. So I bought a snare drum. I thought I'd record my own drum samples or even record a drum track one drum at a time if I could pull it off. The live snare drum that I recorded sounded so good that I decided I needed to attack the kick drum next. At that point, it made sense to get an entire drum kit. And this is where the challenge in recording kicked in. My home studio is not portable, and I needed to record the drums in a separate location. I rented a practice space and started learning how to mic a drum kit. I'd been watching YouTube videos from the likes of Produce Like a Pro and Spectre Sound Studios, as well as a litany of others to learn how to record drums. The thing that was interesting to me was that nearly all of the approaches that I saw online were about how to make cheap drums sound good or how to make a good recording with cheap microphones. I wanted to take a different approach. I wanted to make professional sounding recordings without investing in a high-end preamp and compressor for each channel. Instead, the part of the signal chain that I wanted to invest in the most was drums and microphones, thinking this would have the biggest impact on sound quality. So I bought top drums and microphones. And here's where the key to recording a remote drum kit comes in. I thought that if I recorded into 32-bit float, I could run the individual tracks through compressors and even preamps later. I would handle EQ in the box for now, but if I wanted to outboard EQ, I'd have the ability to reprocess my tracks later. So here's what I did. I bought two Zoom F6 field recorders and hooked them up to each other so that the time code out from the first one would trigger the second one to start recording. I used a TRS to TSY adapter and changed some settings in the recorder in order to do this. Using the Bluetooth accessory, I'm even able to trigger them to start recording from my phone. This allows me 12 microphone inputs. When I'm finished recording, I leave the studio with two SD cards and finish everything else in post at home. Because it's recording in 32-bit float, I don't have to set levels. Now why is that? Let's talk about how 32-bit float works and why it isn't necessary to set levels. I want to pay special attention to the float designation because I think this is usually overlooked. Float is short for floating point and it refers to the way that the decimal point is handled in binary calculations. The alternative to float is fixed point. Fundamentally, this refers to how the decimal point is used in representing numbers. This is a different way of representing numbers with the same number of bits. With floating point, we're representing the value with scientific notation rather than using an integer format. Some of the bits are used to represent an exponent rather than using all of them to represent an integer value. In real world terms, with 32-bit fixed point integer representation, 
we can represent about 4.3 billion states. With the 32-bit floating point format adopted for audio recording, we can represent about 4.6 times 10 to the 38 states. In terms of audio range, with 32-bit fixed, we would be able to represent 192 decibels of dynamic range. And with 32-bit float, we're able to represent 1,528 decibels of dynamic range. Now, due to the properties of air, the theoretical loudest sound that could be produced in air is 194 decibels. So honestly, I'm not sure why 32-bit fixed wouldn't have been enough. Maybe one of you can help answer that question. At any rate, what we have to work with is 32-bit float. Why is this so different than the way we recorded before? What has to happen next is that the signal you recorded with that massive dynamic range has to be mapped to a much smaller data range that you'll be exporting from your DAW as an audio recording. If you're rendering in 24-bit PCM, you're going from 1,528 decibels of dynamic range down to 144.5 decibels of dynamic range. But you get to decide which portion of that dynamic range you want to work with. Do you normalize for loud sounds or do you normalize for quiet sounds? Traditionally, you'd be making this decision at the time of recording by setting the gain for each channel. But with 32-bit float, you're pushing that decision to be made in post. And that's the crux of it. It's a workflow change that feels foreign to experienced audio engineers. But if you choose to take advantage of it, it gives tremendous freedom, not only in how you work with audio, but how you physically set up your studio because your real-time recording gear can become post-production gear instead, and it can be located in a totally different physical space. Because of this huge dynamic range, there's no need to set levels. Every sound is captured from a mouse whisper to a rocket launch. It's analogous to the way that raw files are used with digital photography. Instead of capturing the JPEG, we're capturing all of the data. The data is captured by the recorder and you can decide what cross-section of it you want to work with in post. Here's an example from my drum studio. I can play the drums and then speak at a low level and all of the audio is captured. Here the audio is normalized for my voice. And now for the drums. I'm not wearing a lav microphone or anything in this clip. This is my voice as captured by the room mic and the drum kit. I can even speak very quietly. This audio is from a single track without adjusting levels. How is this possible? Here's what's going on. When we record music, we're used to literally capturing what we are going to reproduce later. With 32-bit float, we can capture everything all at once and decide what slice of the waveform's amplitude we're going to work with later. You can even split a track and normalize for two different levels. On the left side here, I've normalized for spoken word, and on the right side, I've normalized for drums. You can make this decision with a DAW that supports 32-bit float files later. I use Reaper for this. One thing I find odd about the Zoom F6 is that despite its implementation of 32-bit float allowing more than 1,500 decibels of dynamic range, the max SPL of its analog input circuitry is only 131 decibels. I'm not sure why this limitation exists. If you exceed this, you'll get an error exceeding maximum input level. Yes, 131 decibels is extremely loud, but I ran into this problem using the Neumann KM184 on hi-hat. The max SPL of this mic is listed at 138 decibels. And when playing the kit with full force, the sound of the hi-hat plus all of the other drums together, I was able to exceed the input level of the F6. My solution to this was to use a Shure A15AS switchable attenuator as a pad to reduce the output of the microphone. It looks like Sound Devices audio recorders have the same limitation when I look at their specifications. So I'm not sure if there's a 32-bit recorder on the market yet that actually exceeds the SPL capabilities of any microphone on the market. In my opinion, the weak link in this whole setup is the preamps and the F6. While I think they're truly outstanding from a transparency perspective, they do seem to be inferior to the preamps offered by the sound devices recorders in the examples I've heard by Curtis Judd. So I'm eager to make the switch at some point to a different recorder. Do any of you want to know how I mic the drum kit? 
How about how I mix the drums? Let me know in the comments and I can make a video about the end-to-end -end production process for recording drums. But here's a quick summary. I bring the 32-bit float files into Reaper and separate each channel into its own track. Then I normalize each track, mix it, and apply EQ in the box. For some tracks, I then send them to an outboard compressor, record that back into Reaper, and use it in my final output. I also have a couple of techniques I use to make the room sound much bigger than it is. I've been wanting to make this video for a while, but I didn't have a YouTube channel. So please like and subscribe to this video. I'm trying to get things going here and it would really help me out. Goodbye.